Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast. I'm Eric Olander. And as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden of Witts University in Johannesburg, South Africa. Kobus, a very good afternoon to you. Good afternoon. Kobus, you know, normally when we prepare for the show, uh, it's something I actually look forward to. This was today, I got to say, though, um, was difficult for me um, because I, I intentionally avoided for a long time to watch The Ivory Game, which was it's just a new documentary that was put out on Netflix. And because it's on Netflix, it's hard for people to see. And, you know, I feel like you and I have been covering the ivory issue now for almost a decade. I feel that we've seen a lot of documentaries. We've seen a lot of the horrific images. We've studied the violence. We've kind of, we had a mental kind of image of how complex the story is. You and I get into debates online with Western environmentalists who, and conservationists who put forward these very simplistic solutions. If only the Chinese did this, or if only Africa did that, or whatever. And so I, I really have to be honest with you that I got to a point where I felt like I knew everything that I needed to know about the ivory trade. And, and I really didn't want to watch the, the, game, the movie because these animals personally mean so much to me and I just don't need to see the killing of it. And so in preparation for our show today, because we're going to be focusing on the ivory game, uh, I watched it. And um, it was very, very difficult, but very eye-opening and very, very moving. Uh, it's definitely the best piece of media on the ivory trade that I have ever seen, watched, or read. Um, it is very, very powerful because it shows the complexity. And Cobus, one of the key takeaways from this film is that it didn't put white people in the front. And you and I have talked about the media narratives, how CNN and BBC and France 24 consistently showcase how white people are fighting the elephant, uh, fighting for the elephants. We see the, the white rangers in Gabon. We see the white environmentalists in Paris and London. We see the Duke of Edinburgh in London kind of advocating on behalf of elephants. But we don't see Africans, and in this case, even Chinese. And so to me, I thought of you and the, and the media narratives and how this, this film really changed that. Yes, definitely. Uh, I think part of the, part of this is an excellent film. Uh, you know, kind of, I, I greatly recommend anyone watching it. Um, I also part, part of what makes it so excellent and what makes it so worth watching is exactly that it it undercuts this kind of white savior narrative. Um, and it shows the complexity of being African and being Chinese in the context of this unfolding crisis. Well, the film is only available on Netflix, which makes it difficult for a lot of people to watch it if you're not a Netflix subscriber and if you don't, in fact, have the bandwidth to watch it. I don't normally do this, but I also want to let you know that the film is available on the Pirate Bay. And I think it's that important for people to see that you can go and download it from the torrents. Just look for the Ivory Game and there's a lot of copies there. It um, is actually also it's streaming on YouTube right now. It'll probably be yanked in within half an hour, but it, at, as we speak at the moment, it is on YouTube. Yeah, so it'll be on YouTube. It's it'll be on the pirate networks. It's out there. You can look for it. I really encourage you to 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 watch it. But just to give you a flavor of what the of what the film is about, and just you know the, the celebrity factors. You know, you may have heard that. This was, uh, you know, executive produced by Leonardo DiCaprio. But I think that's irrelevant here because the actual narrative of the movie is far more important than, you know, some celebrity who put his money behind it and his name behind it. But let's play the trailer now. And just to give you a, a sample of the ivory game. Africa's got 700 tons of ivory. It's being moved across continents, being sold under the table. It's fueling international crime. Traders in ivory actually want extinction of elephants. The less elephants there are, the more the price rises. And it's a race against time. I can't afford to see elephants dying like this. We are in a war zone. The poacher's prepared to shoot at you, and you have to be prepared to shoot back. We are talking about hundreds of tons of ivory getting into mainland China. Organized crime is never far away. The buyer is secret, the seller is secret, the killer is secret. Everything is secret. You cannot trust anyone. He's the number one wanted poacher right now. One person has in his hands the destiny of an entire species. Killing an elephant is more than just killing an individual animal. It's tough because they're connected to each other. They're destroying a family. The feelings they have go far and beyond our understanding. 
As long as ivory is worth money, these poor animals are going to be annihilated. They are a walking target. Ivory trafficking is extremely dangerous. Are we really going to allow the biggest mammal on Earth to disappear? Shoot! 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 One of the voices that was not included in that trailer, uh, but is central to the entire film and the narrative of the film, uh, in the storyline about the complexity of it, particularly in the interaction between Africa and China, is Huang Hongxiang. And for those of you who have been following our show, you know uh, Hongxiang. He's been on it many times uh, in lots of different capacities. Uh, in this particular case, uh, he was one of the central undercover investigators uh, conducting sting operations in Tanzania, in Vietnam, in China, in Kenya. Uh, and then he joins us on the line today from Lusaka, Zambia. Welcome back to the program, Hongxiang. Thank you, and good afternoon. Hongxiang, I really want to focus on what your role in this film was, because you, you play, you really represented the voice of the Chinese side of this debate. And, and I think you have to be commended for the bravery that you exhibited, taking enormous personal risk, exposing yourself to tremendous danger, uh, you know, I live here in Vietnam where uh, the ivory trade is flourishing. I, I'm not familiar with the particular village that you went to, but I do appreciate the risks that you took also in China and Hong Kong with the triads. So really, you know, I, I just want to give you a lot of credit for that. One of the opening lines that you had in the film was that people, you know, assume that all Chinese are complicit in this. And one of the things that you're trying to communicate to people is that not all Chinese believe in, the, in ivory, not all Chinese believe in, in the destruction of these animals and the consumption of ivory, and you're trying to kind of change that story. But yet one of the other pieces of information that came out from Andrea Crosta, who's a very famous uh, wild, uh, an, uh, elephant advocate, was that the China market um, allows for five tons of legal ivory trade every year but yet has a demand for 100 tons every year. And as long as that demand imbalance remains, and as long as the legal trade of ivory remains, the fate of the African elephant is in China's hands. So I guess my question for you is, are you enough? Are the young people in China today enough? You know, the young people who are advocating on social media that you know, they don't want the ivory trade. You are clearly an advocate. But as long as there's a 95-ton difference between the supply and the demand, between the legal and the illegal, it, it, I just wonder if, if really, are you enough? Well, actually, so I would say I agree with what Andrea says, actually. I think China's ivory market needs to be closed down. And actually, not only in China, also in Southern Africa, in Europe, in a lot of countries. I think it needs to be totally shut down. But on the other hand, I think it's very important for people to be aware. Like in China, there are, there's a huge market for ivory. But at the same time, the Chinese who purchase ivory are less than 0.1% of the population. So really, it's not about Chinese. It's just because China is such a huge country. Even 0.1% of the population could already be a huge market. This is what people need to be aware of. Um, Hong Sheng, to, to, to situate people who, who haven't watched the movie yet, um, you do undercover work um, as, as, part of the, as part of sting operations for, you know, to expose some of the dealers. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what that took. Like, what was the logistics of doing that un undercover work and doing it on camera? You know, kind of how did, how did shooting those scenes actually work? Uh, so what happened is in 2013, because of Visit University China-Africa reporting program, I went to Africa and I started my three months undercover investigation in Southern Africa about ivory and rhino horn trade. And because of that, some investigation organization, they later on, they reached out to me and want me to help them. Because as an undercover Chinese investigator, you can get a lot of trust from the traffickers and you can advance the investigation a lot. And then while I was doing some of those investigations, 
uh, one of the investigator who is also in the film called Ophia, she introduced me with the filmmaker. So what happened is in some of the later operations, we still we, we still went on and do our investigations, but the filming team, they accompany us. So they were there when we were doing the investigations. So that is how it was filmed. Now, one of the things that you make very clear in the movie is that the people that you're dealing with in these undercover investigations are oftentimes uh, extremely powerful, very violent, and highly organized and very heavily armed. So these are the organized crime syndicates in Tanzania and Africa. You ran into potentially some of those here in Vietnam. You Certainly in Hong Kong, there was indications that it was the triads that may have been involved, and you were involved in all of that. Why weren't you concerned, or maybe let me rephrase that, were you concerned about exposing your identity, and then there might be retribution against you, your family, your friends? You know, what about your own personal security now that this film is all over the world and being seen all over the world? Yeah, to be honest, this used to concern me a lot uh, because to participate as an investigator to help in undercover operation is one thing. To show my face in a film like this is another thing that can add much risk to the first thing. But when I was thinking about it, I was thinking if they burn my face in this movie, then again in this film, it will be the old narrative again, which is white people being good people, black people being bad people, and Chinese people being the worst people. And I think personally, as someone who has a background of media communication, I believe it's more important for the world to close some of the communication gap, to be able to understand and engage more on the Chinese side than having one single Chinese investigator. That's why I believe it's very important for me to show my face and come out to speak. But are you field. are you worried about your personal? But are you worried about your personal safety now that people know who you are and they know you're very visible? Yeah, a little bit. But actually, to me, I feel like the reason you decide you want to do something or not is not really about whether you feel it's dangerous or not. It's whether you think it's important enough or not. So I think it's a risk that is worthy to be taken. Um, obviously, you know, you are communicating this other view of being Chinese to the world, but also to China. Um, how do you know whether this documentary has been seen in China? Have you received any any reaction to it from Chinese? Well, so far, not many Chinese people have seen the film yet, but I have heard from some of my Chinese friends who have seen it. And overall, the reaction is this is a wonderful movie. I think no one can deny that. It's a really wonderful and powerful movie. On the other hand, some of the Chinese friends I have, they are concerned because they feel China is somehow still portrayed unfairly because of the, the way is the movie is ending now. I know, but this is, the, this is the instinctive Chinese nationalism that comes out. And the sensitivities that Chinese that that Chinese leaders and the Chinese net and the and Chinese people have to being criticized, particularly by outsiders, but the fact remains that it's the Chinese demand for ivory that is fueling so much of of the killing. So I'm not. I, I just I get so frustrated every time I hear this re, this re, reflective, responsive argument from from the Chinese, and I say the Chinese, I'm meaning kind of the Chinese, mostly for me it's on social media, but clearly for you it's, um, it's with your, your friends that they don't, want, they don't feel like they're being portrayed fairly, but at the end of the day, what is inaccurate about the consumption of 100 tons of ivory every year? Well, to be honest, I don't quite agree with this, um, with you actually. So on one hand, I think a lot of Chinese people, so first, Let's admit there are some Chinese people, they are not happy whenever you say China has any problem. That's some Chinese people, they, they exist. But on the other hand, I feel a lot of the Chinese, they're actually okay if you, you tell them like China is the biggest ivory market, like myself and all of my friends. But still, in the Western and international narrative, I think what happened unfair is something like this. For example, in this film, like it's very clear that it's not only China's problem. There are a lot of like illegal, like legal ivory market here and there. However, at the ending, everything goes to China. So that I would say is a little bit unfair. Second, Chinese government has 
despite many Western people may not think so, Chinese government, they have done a lot in terms of law enforcement and so on. It may not be enough, but no one has done enough. But all the effort of the Chinese government side is not really seen, which I also think is a little unfair as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would add to that as well. Obviously, the the you know one of the main reasons why we in this crisis at the moment is actually goes back to the way that the Europeans treated Africa in the nineteenth century. You know, um, the kind of level of of environmental disruption and mass hunting that went on by Europeans in the nineteenth century like created the situation that we have now. Um, but anyway, that's you know kind of ancient history. More more importantly. Um, do you feel satisfied that the narrative, the kind of white savior narrative that we that we discussed before, you know, kind of a white people coming in and saving elephants, saving Africa, do, do you feel that, are you satisfied that some of that has been disrupted a little bit by this film? Of course, actually, in my personal view, I really like this film because I think it's the most objective, most balanced film about Ivory Tree so far. It's much better than all the other ones I have seen. So I think it already has been quite great in terms of doing that. You know, the, my theory, and I'd like to run my theory by you to see what you think about why sure. I don't think the, the elephants really stand a chance. And I think that was one of the key messages that came out of this movie was that humanity doesn't have an impulse control and there's just not the will to save these animals. And I think in some ways, because there's no one really accountable and and no and, and that means that the West plays a role in this. And let's not forget, as you pointed out, you know the second largest yeah. ivory market in the world is the United States. Is the United States leveraging its incredible power in foreign aid, in military aid, in all the different ways that it engages African governments to make their protection of wildlife contingent on the aid? It certainly has leverage. You know, Donald Trump prides himself on being a negotiator. You know, this is going to be interesting to see if he takes up this issue. I highly doubt it. But nonetheless, that is some one, one opportunity. The Europeans have done really nothing. You know, the Europeans have not put themselves on the line. They will talk things and they will give money to a UN group or whatnot. But at the end of the day, have they kind of sacrificed political capital in the name of elephants and wildlife? No. The Chinese, as um, you've said, Eric, yeah. So, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but I, I just have to, sorry, you know, just to jump in on that point. I have to wonder what the Americans and the Europeans really can do. Well, no, I mean, they can do a know, lot. Like, uh, they can absolutely do a lot, and this is my frustration. We, the United States, pumps through billions of dollars, and the European Union as well, into aid, military support, financial support, and that can be tied to KPIs and contingency contingent on the protection of elephants. Not to mention the fact yeah, that they but can the, put... The problem, though, is that you're not going to get Africans to do anything that they don't actually want to do. There's a, you know, it's, the, the problem with Ivory is that, you know, kind of there's, there's a billion... You, like, you know, it's, it's, it's like, you know, kind of a, a feeling of... How can I say? It's, it's like it's, there's a faucet, you know, kind of, and you're waiting for the water to come. But on the way out there, people have drilled twenty thousand holes in the pipe, you know, kind of. So the water, the water kind of never comes out. the The problem with ivory and rhino horn is that it always takes place in in rural areas where you're completely dependent on on local communities. Um, and you know, kind of, you can pump as much money from Washington and and Paris and so on into into African coffers as you want. That's not going to change this community. It's, it's like some kind of like insurgent warfare. Um, you know, going to so if African governments and African peoples don't find some kind of way to think of this as theirs in a way that they can actually make a living out of, I don't know that anything from externally can really help it. Okay, so you're now actually. I want to add something on that as well. Sorry, I was just inside his meeting in South Africa. In that meeting, I found something that surprised me a lot in a lot of the votes about whether all elephants should be listed, all African elephants should be listed as Appendix 1, and all ivory trade and so on should be banned and so on. In a lot of situations, I find EU, they, their vote is exactly as the same as China's vote, which is against. Yeah, I mean, and just for those of you not familiar, CITES, correct me if I'm wrong, Kobus, but I think it's the Convention on the International Trade of Endangered Species, and that is the... Yes. The kind of global compact on the trade of ivory, pangolin, all of these 
these kind of endangered wildlife in Africa. And this is, in fact, you know, the controversy because it's under the CITES agreements that allow for the legal trade of stockpiled ivory in some parts of the world, including China. And that's what this is so controversial. And in December, the meeting that Hongxiang attended, there was a move by certain Western governments to put all ivory and all elephants on the endangered protection list. And a lot of African governments said, number one, they've got a big surplus in stock ivory that they want to sell in order to make money. But two, as Kobus put, uh, pointed out, and as the movie kind of documents, you know, local communities have a very complicated relationship with elephants. And it was very, very hard to not be sympathetic to the villagers in, in the film who see the elephants as a threat to their families in terms of consuming their food, dangering their crops, damaging their crops, and threatening their communities. And so, and also simply in terms of in terms of capitalism, you know, there's there's a, there's an instinct to try and survive under capitalism, and the amount of money, the amount of money that the ivory goes for in China is massively more than it is that than, than the poachers get paid, um, but the poachers just still get paid something, you know, kind of, and, and the, you know, it, it still translates into money that comes into your household. Um, so, you know, kind of, if there isn't a way to, to, to shift it over into, to, to make elephants something that could bring money into your household while by staying alive, there's no chance, right? Right. Well, and, and you're now bringing me up to the point that I really wanted to make, and this is where I want to get Hong Xiang's response. So, just in this brief three or four minute conversation, Hong Xiang, we've kind of outlined that there is no single entity that assumes responsibility for this. The West is limited in what it can do, but doesn't do enough. African governments cannot be forced to do things that they don't want to do. People who live on the front lines with the elephants have a complicated relationship with them. The Chinese themselves are struggling with this. Clearly, it's a policy decision that has not been easy to make, otherwise it would have been done. Hong Kong, we see the corruption that is there inside the government and inside the society in terms of not outlawing it fast enough and allowing the trade to flourish. So the point is that the elephants are stuck in between all of these various entities, and so nothing gets done. And that's kind of why it leads me to believe that my son, when he's an adult, he's seven years old now, will not, there will be no elephants for him or rhinos for that matter. Is that your conclusion as well? Well, actually, what I was saying is that instead of like we cannot assume everyone has like anyone has a responsibility, I actually believe everyone has responsibility. China, Europe and Africa, they all share the thing. That is what I would say. But in terms of China, actually I would like to say that in my observation, ivory the ivory business and rhino home business is not something really big and important in China at all, to be honest. So based on all the signals that we have been seeing, China is totally moving to ban ivory trade completely. And in, also in the CITES meeting, we heard from information from all those internal meetings when they're discussing about ivory trade and so on. China's position is we, close, we, will close, we will shut down completely on the ivory trade. And every other country, including Europe and so on, they should do the same. But the response from many countries is, yes, China, you should do that. But for us, Europe, for us in Southern African countries, no need. That's what I have been learning. So the most interesting quote in the whole film came towards the end, or, and it was from Andrea Crosta. Again, he is a very well-known elephant, wildlife uh, protection advocate and activist. And we've interviewed him on the show before. Uh, so I recommend people to kind of search through our archives to take a, list, to, take a listen to what he had to say. And, and really one of the smartest guys out there when it comes to understanding the complexity. And he had a very simple conclusion about the fate of the, end of the African elephant. Actually, I would say that the destiny of elephants is entirely in the hands of one single person, the president of China. So I, I think it's the first time in history that one person has in his hands the destiny of an entire species. So Hong Xiang, Andrea says Xi Jinping controls the fate. And for the first time in humanity, 
one person controls the destiny for an entire animal species. Do you agree with Andrea in that assessment that the president of China is, in fact, the one who controls the destiny of the African elephant? Well, I believe first we need to be very aware that in a film, because of like lens and so on, sometimes we need a little editing. Like Adria said that yes, and also Adria he said many times to me, it's not China that is the only problem. Like every country, every continent, they has their role in this trade, which I believe is more fair statement. But on the other hand, I do agree if China shut down the legal ivory market, it can help a lot. Yeah, I mean, I would add to that that it's, you know, kind of the African governments have not de- done nearly enough. You know, kind of there's no there's no unified voice coming from Africa. I think Kenya is generally the the country that I that I tend to take, uh, the the you know that that I feel should probably take the lead. You know, kind of that they seem to have to be the most forward thinking in lots of ways. But there isn't this incredible division within Africa. Um, Countries like South Africa has frequently played a, a quite a divisive and problematic role, I think. Um, you know, and, and there's shifts within within Southern Africa as well. Um, Ong Shang, as someone as someone who's lived in Africa for a long time and who's done this work in Africa, how do you think Africans should be united or should be kind of motivated? And how should African like how how should this be addressed with African governments? Um. To be honest, I think like regarding how what Africans should do, I think it's best that we let Africans they speak for themselves instead of like a Chinese saying. What I can only say from my eyes, what I see is corruption is really, really a key factor in the ivory trade and so on. So if African can somehow improve in terms of like anti-corruption, it's already helping a lot. Yeah, that was really, you know, both the Hongshan to your point and Kobus to you, what you were, your question. You know, I, I kind of chuckled a little bit towards the end of the film when Kenyan President Kenyatta, you know, came on and kind of said these lofty words about how the elephants are humanities and the world's elephants and it's up to everybody to protect them. And yet we know from, from various investigations that the Kenyan Wildlife Service is rife with corruption and they're facilitating the transfer and the transit and the passage through customs of, of elephant. We know that Kenyan courts have been traditionally very lenient. One of the most encouraging things that I'm seeing now more recently, particularly in places like Tanzania and even in Zambia, which was indicated in the film, is that the, the courts are starting to hand down some real sentences. And I think that's something that really could be done very quickly, is to put real jail time behind the the act of getting caught for this, not the, the the slap on the wrist fines that a lot of African judicial systems have put. I mean, some of the fines are laughable, but that is starting to change a little bit. Um, let's kind of round out our conversation looking towards the future as the film kind of left us on a more optimistic note, which was kind of a weird way of ending given the fact that it went on for almost two hours, you know, highly depressing. I mean... I, to be honest with you, I was, I was you know, so very emotional through a lot of it. But there's an undercover source for wild leaks in Beijing known as, identified as Omega. And Andrea asks her, why does she doing this? Because she faced, you know, significant personal risk. And she almost got into very serious trouble um, when she was discovered that she was doing, that she was undercover. And there was, un, there was something that Omega said, which, which I'd like to get your reaction to. She said, I think it's decision-making time for China. And I'm curious about what your response is to that when, again, this is not coming from a Westerner. This is coming from you know, a, a Chinese person who, like you, is taking significant personal risk on behalf of the African elephant, but comes to the conclusion that it's really about China and what direction China goes. What was your response to Omega's thoughts on that? I actually agree completely with this particular saying. I think it's China's decision-making time. And I think it's very easy to see that because obviously ivory trade is supply side and demand side, two sides problem. But with the supply side in Africa right now, let's be honest, there's no way Africa can get rid of corruption soon. So it's much more reason, realistic to expect China to shut down the ivory market than to expect Africa to shut down corruption. In this way, I totally agree with what Andrea said. Now China holds the key. And I believe more and more Chinese would 
participate and they will become part of this key. I tend to agree. Um, you know, kind of both, both in in terms of China being being in a position to um, to take the lead. Um, I think in a lot of ways, the you know, kind of the the developments in Ch- in the UK and Europe and in in America over the last year. Um, you know, is pushing China towards a, towards some kind of like additional leadership position in the world, um, and I also sadly agree with your view of Africa. You know, kind of, I think Africa, like corruption, is so endemic in Africa that it's it's going to take generations to try and fix, um, and the elephants just don't have that that amount of time. And to be fair, that you know, as the documentary reveals, it's really not just China. Vietnam is now becoming a central player in all of this, in part because. There's still a demand here. There's a high level of corruption within the public service and the security service. And the cross-border trade into China is one of the back doors. So as China cracks down on the ivory trade, it's going to be going to the border states and crossing in, and both for domestic consumption here in Vietnam as well as for the China market as well. You know, Cobus, when I get into discussions with particularly Americans, but also Europeans on this subject, and You know, again, oftentimes Americans come with a very simple solution. If only China did this, if only someone else did that, then, you know, this problem would actually be solved. And the comparison that I make on about ivory is the drug problem in the United States, because there's a lot of similarities, I think. You know, you look at the people who grow the the poppy, they make nothing off of this in Mexico, Colombia, Peru. And that seems to me like the poachers in Africa when they're getting paid seven dollars a kilo for for ivory and they reminded me a lot of the the poppy growers in afghanistan and and also some of these uh, south american countries and yet the demand from the united states is unrelenting for opioids for marijuana for you know for drugs that fuel the violence in a lot of these countries and continue to poison people in, in my country and so that's a problem we've been fighting for my entire life and we have not made any progress on whatsoever and I think there's some similarities to the criminal syndicates, the supply and demand that Hong Xiang talked about. And, and again, it goes to what we've heard from so many of our guests over the years, that really this is as much a wildlife problem as it is an organized crime problem. And we've been no, luck, no, no more successful containing illegal trafficking, human trafficking, arms trafficking, narcotics trafficking, as we have with wildlife products as well. So I think there's some similarities with other global problems like this, Copas. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, and it has to be tackled globally, although I'm not 100% sure how that will happen. Yeah, and I think, you know, our global environmental talks are showing that we as people have a difficult time kind of reacting globally. Hong Xiang, you know, what's next for you? You've done this incredible film. You're doing great work at the China House Kenya, where you're working with uh, Chinese companies on corporate social responsibility. You're also bringing over young Chinese people to experience Kenya, experience Africa, to educate them about some of the issues on the ground, wildlife, CSR, Chinese investment. What's, uh, what's next for what you're doing? Well, as like, I always believe, and which is similar to what other people were saying in the film, but it may has a different implication. I believe China is the key. So if China is the part of the problem of the ivory trade, it is part of the solution. And so far what I have been seeing is Chinese people, a lot of them, they are not really being engaged in this conversation. But they could, and they could partake, They could become really helpful. Imagine me as a one single Chinese person, I can help a lot in this kind of investigations. And in China, there are so many people, they, they can do similar things to me, or even much better. So what we as China House, what we really want is we want to engage the Chinese people. And we believe that is the game changer to the whole thing. So if people want to follow what you are doing, both at China House and maybe on WeChat, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Uh, well, they can search China House Kenya on Facebook, and they, or they can just like search for my name on Facebook, and then they can connect with me when I'm outside of China. And your name is Huang Hongxiang, H-U-A-N-G. Uh, first name H O N G X I A N G. That's Huang Hong Xiang. Yes. Listen, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule in Lusaka, Zambia today. We are so grateful and congratulations again on an amazing uh, documentary and for the bravery that you have displayed in this documentary. I think we're all grateful. Thank you. And for Kobus Van Staden, I'm Eric Olander. We'll be back again very soon with another edition of the China in Africa podcast. Thank you so much for listening. 
The discussion continues online. Head over to Facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show or follow China Africa News that's updated every four hours, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The guys are also on Twitter, where you can find Kobus at Stadenesk or Eric at Eolander. That's E-O-L-A-N-D-E-R. Subscribe to the China Africa podcast on iTunes or download the mobile apps for iOS, Android, or Windows Phone. Just head over to your favorite store and search for China Africa.